We've got a problem in this country right now with the levels of air pollutants that exist in the entire eastern part of the United States. That is the, the region east of the Mississippi River, including the Midwest, the Northeast, and the Southeast. The levels of sulfates in the atmosphere are above those threshold concentrations associated with adverse health effects. We find that when our concentrations of sulfates, for instance, exceed 9 to 10 micrograms per cubic meter, we get aggravation of asthma, of heart disease, of lung disease, and of the pulmonary function, lung function of school children. Air pollution really doesn't cause people to die in the streets or to fall over. It's a very subtle type of effect that we see with air pollution. We don't feel the effect of today's air pollution immediately. We get a cumulative response from a lifelong exposure to air pollution so that our health today may be impaired by 10 or 20 percent over what it would otherwise be if we lived in a clean environment. Laboratory studies with ozone, our second pollutant, have been done at the EPA's Clinical Research Laboratory at Research Triangle Park by the chief of the physiology branch, Dr. Nicholas Rummel. We've been studying the effects of ozone on lung function in exposed volunteers. Ozone is an irritating gas that is found particularly in smoggy environments. And we found that after levels of exposure that are comparable to what people experience in urban environments, there are definite effects on lung function after two hours of exposure. Subjects feel some discomfort in their chest, they cough some, they have some irritation of their mucous membranes, throat, eyes, for instance. After four hours, the effects on lung function are more pronounced, and also the symptoms that the subjects report are somewhat more serious. They cough more, they're more aware of discomfort and actual pain in their chest after they take a deep breath. Another thing that we found in the laboratory in our subjects who have been exposed to ozone is that certain of the white cells that are circulating in the blood that are responsible for dealing with infection are impaired after a short exposure to ozone. What this all means is that after exposure to ozone, we think you're more likely to suffer an infection if you're challenged with an infectious agent. Formerly, we thought the problem with ozone was a regional problem confined particularly to the area of Southern California. In recent years, we've been finding elevated levels of ozone in widely dispersed areas of the country. Our third pollutant, particulate matter, has been examined by Dr. Douglas Hammer, EPA science consultant, and an epidemiologist who looks at health conditions in terms of groups of people. For the past several years, I've been studying the health effects of environmental pollution. And I've been particularly interested in the health effects of air pollution on respiratory disease in children. One reason is that for children, anywhere from 50 to up to 80% of the diseases that they ever get are diseases of the respiratory tract. Recently, we've got the study of children living in two southeastern cities, Birmingham, Alabama, and Charlotte, North Carolina. These cities differed in exposure to particulate matter, and all particulate matter is is simply a measure of the solid particles in the air, with Birmingham having higher levels due to the higher amount of industry in that city. What we found in this study was that children living in a higher particulate exposure city had higher rates of all acute respiratory diseases, including croup, bronchitis, pneumonia, and hospitalization for these diseases. So the air pollution uh, causes two problems to us. It causes an increase in the acute respiratory disease burden in children now, and on top of that, it, there, there seems to be a real risk of an, uh, or a real concern for an increased risk of chronic respiratory disease in these trained children when they grow up and become adults. Our fourth pollutant, carbon monoxide, is produced primarily by automobiles and has been extensively studied by Dr. Wilbert Aronow, professor of medicine at the University of California at Irvine. Carbon monoxide is a common air pollutant. Carbon monoxide has been demonstrated in numerous studies to be harmful to people. Carbon monoxide enters into the bloodstream more readily than does oxygen. Thus, carbon monoxide displaces oxygen from hemoglobin. The result is that for a totally healthy person, the ability to perform exercise is reduced, 
and for the cardiovascular patient who is unable to compensate for the decreased oxygen supply, this can be a life-threatening situation. The evidence clearly indicates that heavy atmospheric carbon monoxide pollution is harmful to the function of the heart in patients with heart disease and also in people who are perfectly healthy. People who have coronary heart disease in the presence of heavy atmospheric carbon monoxide pollution are more likely to have a heart attack, and if they have a heart attack, are more likely to die from this heart attack. Heavy atmospheric carbon monoxide pollution also is harmful to people who have lung disease, to patients who have cerebral vascular disease, to patients who have peripheral vascular disease, and to patients with anemia. Heavy atmospheric carbon monoxide pollution is clearly a public health hazard. Having looked at the overall adverse health effects of four major pollutants, we turn to the specific effects air pollution has on our respiratory systems. Dr. Stanley Rokoff, medical director of the Los Angeles Lung Association, sees the effects on his patients. The pattern of pollutant injury on people, uh, at least as far as the respiratory tract, seems to follow this kind of scenario. Material that is inhaled, such as oxidants at appropriate levels, or the sulfur oxides or sulfates, uh, injures or irritates the upper airway. So that one of the early complaints one gets is an increased nasal congestion, increased mucus formation, need to hack more material out of the airway. But with higher concentrations and the uh, use of mouth breathing, especially if one is exercising and having to move air more violently, the material uh, penetrates the lower airway, the trachea, the bronchial tree. And all along the way, there are different kinds of impact of response that the human has. He has greater difficulty with the system that is supposed to cleanse his lungs. He has uh, irritation of the airways, which actually <clears throat> causes some constriction of the muscle in the airways, the smooth muscle of the airways. And he has some difficulty with the distribution of gases to the lungs, uh, the oxygen that he needs to take up and the getting rid of carbon dioxide from his lungs. Uh, this is a pattern then of acute airway irritation effects that have acute responses in people. In addition to air pollution's immediate effects on our respiratory systems, it has long-range implications for our health. Much research in this area has been done at the EPA's Health Effects Research Laboratory at Research Triangle Park. Its director is Dr. John Knelson. In the past uh, two or three decades, the major causes of death and disease that plagued humankind over the last several thousand years have been brought under control for the most part. And we realize that we're now left with basically three major disease processes that cause sickness and death, and that those are heart disease, lung disease, and cancer. And then when we realize that the more we understand about air pollution, the more we are convinced that air pollution is a real contributing factor to disease and death from all three of these causes. One of the problems of controlling air pollution is that it travels much farther from its source than scientists previously thought. Dr. Bernard Steigerwald is the EPA's Director of Air Quality Planning and Standards. Work over the past several years, research done with mobile vans such as we have here, have shown us that air pollution is not only a city problem. It can be transported many tens of miles into the countryside and can affect the health of non-urban dwellers. Also, sources far out into the countryside can transport their air pollution into the city, often modified in the atmosphere so that it is, it is more of a health problem a hundred miles from the source than up near the source. Dr. Gershon Schaefer, president of the California Thoracic Society and a specialist in pulmonary medicine. 
sees the effects of remotely produced pollution on his patients in Southern California. The type of air that we have here looks like an industrial or factory town. Actually, we have a very minimal amount of industry and practically nothing that produces stationary pollution. However, our air pollution is generated elsewhere, particularly from automobiles, and blows on the winds into this area. The currents of the winds can carry pollution for hundreds of miles, and unfortunately, this area sits in a spot that carries cross-current of smog from several areas. Up to five, six years ago, people were moving to this area, sent by their physicians in other parts of the country, because they had chronic lung disease, asthma, bronchitis, emphysema, because this was the healthiest place they felt in the country that they could live. You can see what it looks like now, and this is one of our better days. Approximately six months out of the year, we're living in what I consider a state of chronic public health emergency, as far as the air we breathe. On days of very high pollution, I will have up to 17 patients who will have to be worked into my office as emergencies. These are people who are having trouble breathing, who are coughing, who are wheezing, and are in extreme difficulty with their lung, lung conditions. Unfortunately, even healthy people are having trouble with their breathing capacity. On bad days, why, we have to take the children off the playgrounds. We have to reschedule Little League games. And on these occasions, we have seen children vomiting in swimming pools because they've been exercising. Still another problem in controlling air pollution is the trend toward moving sources, such as power plants, into rural areas. This has been a special concern of Dr. Richard Gere, a pediatrician in southwestern Colorado. Uh, the inhabitants of this area became... Uh particularly uh, concerned about the opening of four major power plants in the southwest. At that time, we did a study of uh, respiratory and lung disease of children and found an alarming increase, almost a doubling effect over the five years that the plants had opened. Today, we are again concerned because there are eight to 10, possibly 12 more power plants in the whole southwest being contemplated for uh, opening in the next five or 10 years. A lot of people like to come and visit here from the larger metropolitan areas. And I think they're a bit naive. They look at the sky here and they say, my God, this is so beautiful. We can never pollute that. So uh, I think they take the naive uh, idea that we'll build all the power plants here to furnish the power for uh, Los Angeles and uh, Phoenix. And I think uh, a lot of uh, research shown that if this is done, it may very well affect our health and affect the health of these children. The Clean Air Act, as amended, authorized the Environmental Protection Agency to set air quality standards. The EPA set such standards for six major pollutants, establishing for the first time a goal for clean air. The control of uh, air pollution is a tough job that involves a long chain of complicated technical information and regulatory decisions. We've talked principally about the health effects of air pollution that form the target. This target comes out specifically as an air quality standard, which is the goal for air pollution throughout the country. At the other end of the chain is the control of air pollution in order to meet that goal. We have here a research sulfur dioxide scrubber. The one we have here is about one one thousandth as large as it must be out in the field, it can do an effective job of taking sulfur dioxide out of the exhaust gases and is a key feature in meeting the ambient air quality standards for sulfur dioxide in most major metropolitan areas. The problem of air pollution in this country has, has changed a lot over the past several decades. Air pollution was thought of as black smoke from industry smokestacks. That generally is no longer our major problem. What we have today is much more subtle and in many ways much more difficult to control. Just because we can't see something coming from the stack does not mean that it's not making a significant contribution to the air pollution problem. The pollution problem caused by automobiles is an urgent concern of engineer Brian Ketchum former director of the office which prepared New York City's transportation control plan. When we think of air pollution, we normally think of cars, and for good reason. 
cars and trucks produce between 70 and 100 percent of the carbon monoxide emitted into our urban centers. Cars and trucks produce hydrocarbons and oxides of nitrogen as well. Motor vehicles uh, contribute as much as 50 percent of the oxidant problem in our urban centers. The internal combustion engine, as designed, uncontrolled, is a fairly dirty engine. The catalytic converter, which has been installed on all cars beginning in 1975, does a fairly good job in cleaning up hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide, but it requires a good deal of consumer maintenance and frequent maintenance to make sure that it does work effectively. Uh, it does not, however, control oxides of nitrogen or the various particulates emitted from a passenger car. Despite the use of catalytic converters on today's cars and the potential use of alternative power plants in the future, there's a real question of whether uh, we can really clean up automotive air pollution in our urban centers. Uh, there are just so many cars and trucks operating on our streets that it is virtually impossible to meet healthy air quality levels uh, within the foreseeable future without reducing vehicle use. Uh, the real solutions are to minimize the amount of wasteful travel, unnecessary travel that today, for example, consumes virtually 40% of the nation's energy budget. The Environmental Protection Agency has uh, promulgated a number of plans for uh, close to 30 urban centers in which they have proposed reducing vehicle use, substituting alternatives uh, such as carpooling, uh, dial a bus, uh, and a vast increase in the use of our public transit services. These are essential if we are to ever reach healthy levels of air in our urban centers. The technology and planning strategies to control air pollution exist, but social and economic factors strongly affect our decisions about using them. Everyone wants to look at the cost of controlling the environment and compare this to the real cost of people, one has to see that this is a very small cost. The cost of dying is expensive. The cost of medical care is the biggest expense in this society, almost $80 billion. The loss from work, a billion days a year because of acute respiratory illness, this is a great cost. People with emphysema are frequently people who don't work, so that their health costs are burdens on all of society. And these people enter hospitals twice as often as other people, and they stay there twice as long. This is a cost for all of us. Chronic lung disease is the second highest cause of Social Security disability in people under the age of 65. This is more than $100 million a year. This is a tremendous cost. So to make comparisons ridiculous, we have to clean up the air. We have to create a viable environment for all of our people. We cannot tell millions of people that they cannot live in cities, that they have to run away. We still get flack about, well, how do you know that air pollution is really responsible for all these disease states that you talk about? And admittedly, when you're dealing with a chronic illness, such as emphysema or chronic bronchitis, where there are multiple causes, it's hard to say air pollution was responsible for 18% of this man's disability. The the system sort of goes back in public health annals to uh, typhoid and its control. It took 40 years for the proofs of the typhoid bacillus and how it got transmitted to people to be established. But some prudent man in England took the handle off the pump that was putting out the contaminated water 40 years earlier because of the association. People drank from that well and they got typhoid fever. Well, that kind of prudent judgment has to be applied in terms of air pollution today. Those of us in medical science feel that there is a clear association between community air pollution and this complex of diseases and that we really can't afford to wait for 40 years of point-by-point point matching of challenge and disease to do something about it. Those things will be too late by then. Decisions being made to control air pollution today are going to have long-range consequences. There are two major reasons for this. First of all, we know that there's a long lag time between a 
and environmental influence and air pollution influence on health and the development of chronic disease such as cancer or chronic lung disease 20 or 30 years in the future. Secondly, we know that the length of time it takes industry to convert to sophisticated control processes takes a decade or more before enough control is exercised to have a significant influence, to have a major influence on the quality of air 25 or 30 years from now. Although difficult, we have the tools to solve the air pollution problem. Research has demonstrated to us that most pollutants can be controlled and that the air quality standards can be met with the diligent application of these tools. The, the final piece of the puzzle is cost and is the will to, to control air pollution. By the air pollution standards that now exist too strict, you've probably seen ads in the paper making these claims that we're paying an unusual cost, a very extreme cost for achieving clean air and that we don't have to have such clean air to preserve human health. The fact of it all is that people who are concerned about human health and who have studied the effects of air pollution on health do not feel that the air quality standards are too strict. Those standards were set with a relatively small margin of safety below the level at which adverse health effects first occur. We have maybe a one, one or two-fold margin of safety below those levels that affect human health. For other standards, such as substances in food or carcinogens or radiation, we set as large as 10 to 100-fold safety standard below the level of adverse health effects. So I don't think that the standards are anywhere too strict, even though those claims have been made. The big question we have to answer now is, what will it do over 70 years? What will it do to young children who have just been born? We don't know the answer because we cannot devise experiments that will give us such a 70-year answer. So if we err at all, it must be on the side of caution in order to protect future generations. And when I say future generations, I mean that literally, because one of the bad pollutants, ozone, for example, has been shown to fracture chromosomes. And this is what may lead not only to abnormal growth, like cancer, but possibly even to abnormal births. What has been happening is that we view the air and the water as a free sewer. It's not a free sewer. The environment will not tolerate continuous exploitation. At a certain point, it will tolerate no more. And at that point, we're going to have to come to grips with it and come to some accord with the environment if we're going to build a better life that all of us really want.